All right, let's, um, I'm going to talk about the best practices of startups. Idea to scale up. Roughly 30 minutes. OK, let's get started. Um, don't need to go through I am. Don't need to talk about who we are. So startups, right? If you look at all the changes in startups over the last like 10 years, you know, I actually think like this is one of the most exciting times now to do, be doing sort of tech startups. You know, I mentioned to you my early startup that I was in. You know, this was a very different time, right? Like this is a different time when we were doing startups back in like 99, 2000. We didn't have a lot of these tools that were actually available to all of you now. So for example, we didn't have things like Amazon Cloud Services. We had to build all that stuff and actually buy hardware and actually build it. Now you can rent it for really cheap. We didn't have a lot of the payment platforms like PayPal and whatnot. We didn't have a lot of the marketing platforms like Facebook and Google, et cetera, et cetera. And so to basically build a general product back in 99, 2000, you had to raise $5 million. Now you probably need $50,000 to do a startup. So there's been some huge changes. It's become easier, faster, and cheaper than it actually ever has been to be doing tech startups. It's a good thing. The problem about this, this is a great book I recommend by Ben Horowitz. He's a, he's a very, very successful startup founder. He started LoudCloud that he has sold to HP for a billion dollars. He's now a very famous VC at Andreessen Horowitz. He wrote this great book talking about the hard things about, about hard things. And so yes, there's a lot of glamour in doing startups, but it's also very, very hard. So what makes startups so great and easy where Almost anybody can do a startup right now. That means there's just so much more competition in startups because everybody can do a startup now. The number of startups has actually mushroomed and ballooned across the globe. And so any sector and any area that you're actually working in, there's probably 50 or 60 competitors across the globe maybe working on the same problem that you're focusing on. And so there's good and bad of this. And the other part too is getting to so-called product to market fit is actually really hard, right? Because there's a lot more startups out there for every single competitive sector. And because of that, there's just a lot more noise. So customers have a hard time figuring out like which product and which service should I actually use. Um, but, and, and so the, the one thing that I'd say is just that you have to invert your thinking, right? And so I think the problem that, that there's these myths in startup land where a lot of people think like, well, you know, all I need is basically to go build this thing and then you know build it and they will come and this is actually a big problem so Seth Godin who's a very famous marketer in the US he says don't find customers for your pro from your product find products for your customers you have to change your thinking and you have to be you know this term called customer centric I think this is actually a big problem in Silicon Valley I think this is the big problem in the tech industry overall of just people who build without actually understanding and actually thinking about who their customers are and so there is actually has been a huge revolution in actually how startups are being made. And a lot of this is, you know, this comes from, um, you know, like Moneyball, from Lean Startup, Little Bets. And these are all great books if you're interested in, in reading. But what has happened is that now there's, there's driving in a little bit more idea of, of experimentation. And there's been a lot more methodology now at actually how to build tech startups properly. And so I'll go through this very quickly, right? So Lean Startup, it's one of the best books. If you have not read this book, you should read this book and practice it. And The Dirty Secret in Silicon Valley, a lot of people say they've read this book, but they don't, have not read the book and they don't follow this practice. We must learn what customers really want, not what they say they want or what we think they should want. And this is actually really important. I'll go through this. The idea about actually startups is you need to be thinking about this like a process. I'm going to repeat this many, many times, is that it is like an experiment, right? And so this idea is that you have to have the mindset of actually experimentation, of having specific goals from the beginning, you know, putting in analytics to test this stuff, you know, then basically rolling this out, executing the experiment, and then what you do is you take those learnings and you optimize the experiment. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about each of these steps over the rest of the presentation, but you have to have the mentality. And this is actually a huge issue in Silicon Valley too, of just a lot of people don't follow this process. And so a big part of this, Katerina Fake, she is now a VC, but prior she had actually sold her last two companies very successfully. One of them was Flickr, which is one of the, the big sort of like photo sharing um, companies that started back in 2005. And so she said, working on the right problem is more important than working hard. And this is something I advise anybody who's in startups or interested in startups. It's just like really understanding this is actually the most important step. And I think a lot of people actually overlook this. And so I'm going to go through some parts of this. 
is number one, start with your interests and expertise, right? Like work on something that actually matters to you because I think too many people, they go and read TechCrunch and they go, oh, wow, this company in the US raised all this money, so I'm gonna go build that version in Kazakhstan or wherever they are. And without really understanding, like, do I even care about this space? You know, do I have expertise in this area? And so you kind of need to start with yourself, right? Startups is all about building something that you want or building something that, you're, that, that you think that your market or your industry actually needs. And this is actually important. The other one is, is, is being customer-centric is who are you going to serve, right? Who is a possible customer? The answer is not everybody in the world. That's actually the wrong answer. The answer is actually a very specific group of people. Who are you going to serve? Who is, who is your customer? That could be teenage girls from age 18 to 21. The more narrow, the better it is for you. Because this idea of just like, if you are trying to serve everybody, you serve nobody. And so startups is about deep focus. The other part, what is the problem, right? What is the problem you're trying to solve for them? What is a specific use case? This is actually my biggest problem with a lot of technological trends, right? Whether it's like VR, AR, blockchain, they just take these technologies and just throw it and slap it into anything, right? It's like, we're blockchain for this. And I'm like, well, okay, is blockchain really the right, you know, the really the right technology and the really the right use case to solve that problem? And most of the time, it's actually not. They just jump on these buzzwords or AI, right? Like, oh, we're AI for this. I'm like, well, does AI actually really make sense as a technology to fix this problem? Most of the time, probably not. And so start with the problem, right? You know, once you understand your customer, who, what is the problem that they're facing that you could actually help them fix? Mentioned to you earlier, think like a scientist, right? You want to have the experimentation. Number one, you have a thesis on what the problem could be. The next stage is actually figuring out how to test it, right? So having the experimentation mentality, and I, I hear this a lot from startup founders, it's like, oh, I know what my customers want, right? And I'm like, how do you know what your customers want? Like most of the time, like, well, I'm the customer, so I know everything. And it's like, you know, that's a little bit dangerous. I think a lot of times I've seen the best companies out there actually started with a very different hypothesis. And so what I see is that you, if you have the experimental mentality, and I actually think this is a big problem our education system actually teaches us, it's about getting good grades, and the way you get good grades is by having the right answer, right? And that's actually, or, and that's actually the wrong way to think about it. I actually think success is actually having the right question, right? That's how you figure out what the truth is in the market. So have a hypothesis. You always want to start with a hypothesis on this is who I think my customer is, and based on talking to them and understanding who the customer is, this is what I think the biggest problem and challenge is. And this is the product that I think I'm going to build for them. You always start with a hypothesis. If you have that, you should not be scared of actually being wrong because you're trying to use this to discover the truth of the market. And there's one great thing, the methodology about MVP, this is called, called minimal viable product, and this is a core piece of actually Eric Ries Lean Startup methodology, is that the way that you want to think about startups is that technical talent is very expensive. Your engineering time, your product management time, your time is actually the most expensive time. So before you actually spend all your time and money building something, what you want to do is build some bare minimal viable product and actually launch that, right? Once you have that bare minimal product, you don't want to waste resources building you know, spending two years building a product that nobody wants. So what you want to do is build something in the cheapest, fastest possible way. And that should be because what you, you don't know who actually will use this or how it will be used. And so this is actually a challenge where, for me, the worst thing that you can actually do is lose time, right? And I stress this. The worst thing you do as a startup founder is actually lose time. So spend all your time building something and not even knowing who your customer is, not even knowing sort of like, who's going to use this. And so you want to sp you spend as little time building the cheapest thing in the fastest possible way to get the feedback. All right. And the other thing is launch as quickly as you possibly can, right? Because there's too many founders actually look for perfection, right? They're like, I'm not going to launch this thing until this is like absolutely perfect. How do you know what is perfect without customer feedback, without market feedback? You don't, right? Perfection in your mind is probably wrong. And so the biggest failure of most startups is that they take too much time building stuff that nobody wants. That's the truth. That's why most startups fail. And 
like I said, you also want to treat every launch as, like, like, as what we call like a smoke test. A smoke test, right, is to see who actually likes what you're doing, who actually uses what you're doing. And so Reid Hoffman, he was a founder of LinkedIn, and he is a VC now at Greylock, one of the best VC funds in Silicon Valley. He has this great quote, which is, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late, right? And so don't search for perfection here. What you want to do is get something rough and ugly out there, get the feedback, and then Im improve your product along the way. And the great thing of the startup days now is that you have a ton of off-the-shelf analytical products you can actually use to track who's actually using your product, track what they're saying, how they're, where they're dropping off. And there's even more tools like this. There's, there's hundreds of tools out there now. But the great thing is just like, I remember when we were starting, you know, when I was at Yahoo in 2001, in my startup back in like 99, we had to build our own products and spend a lot of money and time building our analytical products. Now you can actually rent it, which is amazing for cheap, or in some cases for free. And so use them. The other thing you need to do, you can't just use quantitative analysis, right? Quantitative, quantitative analysis tells you some of the things, but they don't give you the full picture. Do qualitative analysis. That means telephone calls with possible customers, meeting and talking to possible customers. You know, this actually helps you get a full picture of how customers think about what your product does for them. And so really talk to potential customers all the time, especially in early stage, I tell most startup founders, you should be spending probably, whether it's through telephone calls, whether it's meeting them, you should be talking to five to 20 customers every single week, or potential customers at minimum, every single week getting feedback. If you are not doing that, then you are not doing the core things that will help you be successful in the long run. So you should always be talking to customers. If you get anything on this presentation, always be spending time talking to potential customers. All right. And this is why the feedback actually helps you iterate and fix your product along the way, right? Because you don't necessarily know, like a lot of times, the things that you think that they're gonna like in your product, they hate. The things that you're fixing for them, they use your product to fix different use cases. And so you never know. The reality is that nobody knows anything until you actually launch a product and get that feedback and see how they're using your product. And this is actually the core of early stage startups. And this is the core of why most startups fail is because they don't do these basic things. And as part of these conversations, as part of these like data points, you're looking for patterns. You're looking for things that many customers are saying, I hate this, like from different people are saying, I hate this. Or you're looking for ways that customers are, hey, I've noticed that customers use this feature like way more than they use these features. And so you're looking for patterns on how they use your product. You're looking for patterns on the things, things that show up over and over and over and over again. And then you dig in, that allows you to dig in. You're almost like a detective trying to figure out why are they using this product? What are the things that they're doing a lot here? What are the things that they're not using? And that helps you fine tune your product for your customer. Helps you also fine tune and understand who your right customer is too. And the other thing that I'd say is underutilized, particularly if you're focused on business to business, and I still think also relevant for consumer businesses, ask for money, right? Charge them money from the beginning because there's a lot of times I see this is that the best way to figure out whether there's actually demand for your product when somebody's willing to pay money for it. Right, like this is the best test ever of whether you're building something that people want. If they're willing to, you know, even if it's a dollar a month or whatever, right? Like, you know, or, or an euro a month or whatever a month, like even some small amount, if they're not willing to pay for your product, they're either targeting the wrong customer or you're not building something that anybody wants to use. And so this is my hack, right? Charge from the beginning, ask for money from the beginning is scary. But the fact that they're prepared, if you find a group of people that are willing to, to spend money for what you're doing, that means you're probably onto something. And I think too many startup founders are too cowardly to do this because they're like, oh, well, you know, I don't want to find out the truth, right? And I'm like, I'd rather you find out the hard truth than waste two to three years of your life building something that nobody will ever use because you're never going to get your time back. And so the other part is like, you know, you need to do things that don't, that don't scale, right? Do things that don't scale in the beginning. Let me, let me go into, into more detail what this actually means. Of that in the beginning, even though like calling customers and meeting customers, you know, takes a lot of time and it's hard, say when you get like 
10 customers, it's very different when your business is going to be like 1,000 customers, right? But actually, part of, the, the, of doing these unscalable things in the beginning is actually spending time getting the feedback, even though you won't be able to do it when you're 1,000 customers or 10,000 customers. But this allows you to learn, right? When you meet them, you learn from talking to them face to face. And so this is what, what um, you know, Paul Graham of Y Combinator actually talks about. It's like, you want to do unscalable things because in the be beginning, it's all about the learning process. And so yes, these things don't scale in the long term, but in the short term, they help you figure out what matters. And the other part you want to be doing is that you want to understand the stage of where your startup is, right? Because this is actually important. Context, C-O-N-T-E-X-T, context is actually really important because a lot of times the great, new, you know, the great part about startup land right now, there's a lot of blogs, there's a lot of books, there's a lot of talks like mine, right? That, that there's a, not, a lot of knowledge out there where it's like, oh, if I'm a marketplace business, I can go and read about what other marketplace, big successful marketplace businesses actually have done. And so I can learn from them. And that's actually true. But the one part is that you want to be taking learnings from companies that are in a very similar stage from you, right? So let's say you are an early stage marketplace business and you read that, hey, last year Airbnb did this, right? Like Airbnb is a big marketplace of like, you know, apartments and, and housing. And you go, hey, they did this like last year. But what you have to understand is that Airbnb is a company that's worth I think $10 billion now, have raised hundreds of millions of dollars, and has been around for like nine years, right? So what you want to be doing, instead of looking at what Airbnb did last year, look at what Airbnb did the first year of their business. Learn what they did, because the lessons from Airbnb in the first year are going to be more relevant for you as a startup. So understand the stage of the advice that you're getting from these companies, right? Because I see a lot of companies just blindly, startup founders, blindly following advice that they read without understanding, hey, there might be some differences in the stage, could be some differences in the market. Once you understand that, you pick and choose what actually makes sense for you. And so understand the stage and the context of actually the advice that you're actually reading and hearing about. Very, very important, particularly for early stage startups. Um, and growth, so I'm going to talk a little bit about growth. I'm going to spend a lot of time. But there's this great term called like growth hacking. All right? And the big difference of growth hacking in the beginning is that there are ways of getting customers without spending a lot of money. Right? Marketing is important, and that's something once you figure out product-to-market fit. Most of startups have not figured out product-to-market fit. It takes a long time. And so in the beginning, what you want to be doing is trying to find where a lot of your potential customers and users are on the various platforms out there. And so I'll, I'll go into detail. And also two great books. They've been around for a long time. These are two of the best books on growth in general. They strongly recommend that it's actually worth reading, and I won't, won't go into that much detail. But the, what, the one important thing that you actually get out of this that I think that growth is, is actually understanding, like I said, stage that you're in. And so there's a great thing called the R metrics. Um, it's done by one of the founders of 500. It's about understanding what your biggest challenge is in the funnel, right? So acquisition, activation, retention, revenue, referral. And I think a lot of startup founders actually focus too much energy. I don't say a lot of startups in general focus way too much energy, time, and money on the acquisition stage. When in the early stage, it's about finding the niche customer that you're focusing on and making sure that they're going to your product and using your product and staying with your product. Retention, I would argue, is the most important thing. Are they coming back and using your product over and over and over and over again? In early stage, is, I actually think this is the most important part. It's the hardest part to figure out. But by using this framework, it's a great way to understand what the biggest challenge that your startup actually has and where to focus a lot of the experiments on to figure out how to fix it. And so the R metrics, I find, is one of the most useful frameworks because the biggest problem that I also find most startups is an activation retention issue. A lot of times, it's very easy to get people to come visit your site, your service, use your product. The hard part is actually getting to use it over and over and over again to stay. So the activation retention, I think, is a key part that a lot of founders need to focus on. And it's very, very hard. The good news is you have a lot of challenge, you know, you have a lot of channels and distribution channels now to reach people. And so I firmly believe whether it's here in Kazakhstan, you're in Ukraine, in Argentina, anywhere in the world now, you can actually build a big global business, mainly because we have all these great platforms that are globe, you know, global sort of like spanning platforms, the Apple App Store, if you're building mobile apps, you know, Facebook as a platform reaches over 2 billion people 
WhatsApp reaches, I think, over a billion people. So you have these amazing platforms now that can reach your potential customers, which is awesome. The bad thing about it is that these channels actually change all the time. And so you have to keep up with what's going on. What used to work very, very well, like three, four years ago, probably will stop working. And so this happens over and over and over again of things that actually worked well in the beginning actually start to level out. And the way that you do this is how you, you fight this is why you do a lot of testing with the different marketing channels you can actually use. And so what you want to be doing, this is what they call the bullseye framework, is one framework you use is have, spend most of your time and money on the channels that are working really, really well for you right now, but you need to be doing experimentation actually with some possibilities and some what they call long shots, right? Ones for just testing, because you never want to be overly reliant on one channel. The minute one of these channels change, your whole business collapses. And so you want to be focusing on testing as many different channels as possible. This is one good framework. So a lot of times you're spending 80% of your budgets on the one thing that actually works and spending maybe 10 to 20% of your budgets on new emerging areas just to see what could work and what could not work. Experimentation is important. Another one from my friend Andrew Chen is, is this is the barbell um, framework. And this is actually taken from financial services, right? So if, if you are thinking about like investing, right? Like what they do is they recommend you should put half your money into things that are safe, right? Things that work. So bonds, right? And if you want to be sort of like making money on the other side, what you do is you put half your money into very, very risky um, things like stocks or investing in startups, but things that actually have high return, right? Like, you know, you know, high risk and high return. And so the idea is very, very similar. Like the barbell framework is actually look at a lot of these different marketing channels and put half of your budget into things that you know will guarantee an ROI, right? That works well for you and put half of the budget into things that are riskier, right? But could actually have a lot of potential upside. And if you do this, you're never going to become too reliant on one channel for your business success. Okay. And the other thing, this is relevant in general for how you look at customers. This is relevant in general for how you look at these marketing channels. It's Predo's law, the 2080 rule, right? 20% of your users are going to drive 80% of your usage, right? 20% of your customers are going to give you 80% of your revenue. And so by understanding this, this power law is incredibly valuable to grow your business because what you want to be doing is figuring out the 20% of your customer base that you should be focusing on and also understanding how you can find more people who look like that 20% that's driving your business. And so this is one of the most underutilized, I think, principles in your life as well as in, in business overall. And so at the end of the day, you know, in early stage startups, it's easier said than done, right? And this is, this is a quote that's used all the time. Ultimately, it just comes down to making stuff that people want. That's it. It sounds very, very simple, but it's very, very hard to do. But if you follow a lot of the principles, the basic principles I mentioned, and all these things are simple, they're just not easy to implement, but they're very, very simple. If you have this mindset, the odds of your success are substantially higher. And so thank you very much for this, and I hope um, for this opportunity to speak in front of you all, and I hope this was helpful for you. Um, and so I understand I have a bunch of questions I need to um, answer, right? Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so I have two questions, and I think they're going to give me more questions. Is One question is, do you think competition is good or bad? Should we create products that are not... Should we create products, sorry about that. Should we create products that are not on the market yet? Um, here's my view. This is, this is a tough question to answer, but I actually think ultimately competition is good because competition actually, number one, assuming the market's a big market, but I think competition is actually good because it helps you grow the market overall. And it's very, very hard to so creating products that are like, so I, I, first answer, do you think competition is good or bad? I think competition is great. You get to learn from what your competitors are doing. And most of the time, your competitors are probably serving different customers or serving some different use case. So I actually think it's a good thing. And that means that there's going to be a market. I think the danger of actually not having competitors, it probably means that you either could be too early or there's actually no real market for what you're building. Uh, second question is, should we create products that are not on the market yet? Um, it's riskier, but actually, I think that if you create products for the market, if you create products for a market that does not exist yet, 
it takes longer, you have to actually grow that market and you have to educate that market. And in the process of actually doing startups, that makes it much more challenging. But if you have some insight on a market, then you should do it, right? So there's no right or wrong answer here. Um, and let's see, number two, could you please talk about the books that you listed in the very beginning of the session? And so one is um, The Hard Things About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz. Um, and there's another great book called Growth Hacking by um, Ryan Holiday. And another book I recommended was um, Lean Startup by Eric Ries, R-I-E-S. And another book I recommended is um, it's, uh, Growth Marketing by Sean Ellis, um, E-L-L-I-S. And if anyone has any questions, just like email me at marvin, M-A-R-V-I-N, at 500.co. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions if people are too shy or you want more book recommendations. Okay. Hmm? Uh, marvin, it's M-A-R-V-I-N, at 500.co. Меня зовут Расул. У меня я Здравствуйте. Меня зовут Расул, я основатель онлайн-школы по саморазвитию. У меня два вопроса. А как вы думаете, вот если бы вы запускали в США онлайн-школу по саморазвитию, какую-нибудь фишку, какой бы фишкой вы бы могли этот рынок завоевать? И что-нибудь такое на вскидку интересное? Психология, саморазвитие, онлайн-школа. Is this on? Okay. So the first question was, you know, how was I to, if I was to launch a marketplace, a self-development marketplace in the US, I believe that was a question, um, what was the, what was, what is the factors of success? I, I think that's sort of what I understand the question was. Is that true? Da, da, da. So, so here, here's the thing. Schools for like online like self-development, there are so many in the US. The competitive landscape is very, very hard. And so I'll be honest with you. I have not looked at your product. It's very hard for me to go and answer like what feature or specific area like you need to focus on. But what I would say is that, you know, this goes back to what came into my presentation before is that I think, I think it's important that you launch something Right, like number one, figure out like, look at the competitive landscape and see sort of like what they're doing very, very well, what they're not doing very, very well, because you have a lot of competitors. You know, I, we funded probably four or five companies alone, right? So there's a lot of competition. And then look at what they're doing well, like what, what is working, is video good? Um, are there specific areas that are like, you know, specific things in self-development, like maybe like whether it's learning about marketing or learning about personal development, like what are the things that are done very, very well? What are the things that they're not doing very, very well? And then try, if I were you, maybe spend some time going to, whether there's conferences or going and spending time in the US and talking to potential users um, or doing some online surveys to understand where the gaps are in the market. And then I would actually, then I would consider sort of like figuring out, you know, what are the product features and what are the, the types of folks that are either underserved or people who are customers right now of present sites and how you can do, you know, have better features or more better usability or different content. Um, but you have to run a lot of tests. That's a tough one. If the Roy, my question is to Yes. If the Roy, my question is to you, this opinion, it's possible that it's based on the mistakes of the past, that obviously in the foundation of startups, 
должно быть несколько человек. Вот я основатель один. Как мне преодолеть вот этот вот условный закон, грубо говоря? За счет чего? So, so the question was about whether you should have like several founders. And, and my view is that, look, I, I've seen successful startups have like one founder. I've seen successful startups have two founders. I've seen successful startups have like four founders. So there's actually not one thing. But what I will say is that having like at least like a co-founder does, does make your work easier and better. And so I don't like I don't think you should just find a founder, just a co-founder, just for the sake of having a co-founder. Like I've seen successful single founders, so it's okay. But what I will say is that it is helpful having a founder that actually a, a co-founder in your business that you trust, that you trust each other, that are also I, I would say, you know, like we have this term called like, you know, hacker and hustler of just like having a team, right? Like somebody that's good in on the product side and maybe having someone that's good on the business side, that is helpful. Um, because it, it is a hard job being a single, co a single founder, but I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And so you want to do what makes sense for you. It, it, there's no rule that successful startups only have like two founders or must have like three founders. There's no rule there. Спасибо большое. Filippo Bartaccioni, uh, provost of the University of uh, Astana American University. Yes. And we just opened an incubator. Uh, my question is about um, venture capitalists and uh, uh, business angel. Uh, I always have doubts about business angels and uh, especially why somebody should invest the money and if it's good for the um, uh, startupper to actually accept this money. Because in the beginning, of course, you, you look like there are a lot of expenses, so you try to f get a loan, because actually it's a sort of loan. You're, you're selling something. So my question is this. Uh, where is the border between selling your soul and uh, actually getting support? Yeah, so, so I, I'm very torn on business angels, right? I, and, and like I said, my, the, the viewpoint I have is we're based in Silicon Valley, but we invest all over the world. So I see a lot of different ecosystems. My general view, particularly for like emerging ecosystems, whether it's like Kazakhstan, Russia, Ukraine, like ecosystems are very new. Most of the business angels are probably not from the tech industry. And that's actually a big problem in general because most of them are, come from the old world. And so they're usually not helpful. And so my general view is that I actually think like most startups are probably better off not raising money from business angels. I used to call them business devils, right? Because I'd give them money and they take like 50% or 70% of the company and end up taking over the company and destroying the company. And I see this over and over and over again in emerging ecosystems. Versus if you look at the angel industry overall in Silicon Valley, and, and bear in mind, Silicon Valley's been on for like 50 years, right? So it is a very mature ecosystem. Many of the business angels actually come from tech. Many of them are ex-founders. And so they, you know, and they understand the rules. They also understand the ways that you can actually, they give good advice, right? I think that's a challenge of taking money from business angels in, in, you know, from, that aren't from the industry, right? Like aren't from the tech industry. They tend not to be helpful. They tend to be overly controlling of companies. And so I would say bootstrapping, which is basically just taking money from customers, right? Making money and selling your product to customers, I think is underrated. And I think more startups should focus actually on getting money from customers than actually getting money from investors. Because most VCs and most business angels in this region, and I'm talking CIS region overall, are not very good. And uh, the other question is very similar. There are a lot of events that are organized all over uh, in Europe, in Asia, and so on, where they, they support the creation of startups or uh, the development of the ideas or discussion of the ideas. But there is a very poor protection of the copyrights and the real uh, inventor of the idea or the system. Uh, so if you had a new idea or a new startup, would you go in these places to show your idea and participate and maybe get a grant that is very minimal, sharing your ideas and maybe losing it? Um, I think, it, so it depends, right? So number one, like IP, like intellectual property, really only matter, in, in my opinion, really only matters in things like biotech or pharma or like me medical devices. That's actually important, right? So I would be hesitant there. But I think if it's like software and hardware, like nobody cares, 
like the rails i think you need to be sharing there's this mentality that i find in in you know sort of like immature ecosystems of like i don't want somebody to steal my idea like frankly speaking if your idea is easy to copy it's actually probably not a great idea and probably not going to be a great business if you're worried about that then you should probably shouldn't do startups like my view is that you want to be sharing your ideas as, as much as possible because actually the most important part is actually execution is actually the most important thing and so it depends on the industry but generally speaking the software industry nobody cares about ip doesn't really matter. The most important thing is actually getting customers. If you get customers, it's great. And so does that sort of answer your question? Yeah. And so, so for me as a professional investor, um, my, I, my view is that you want to share your idea with as many people as you possibly can to get the feedback because the ideas are cheap. The execution of actually building is really hard, right? And so, for example, people ask me, like, like I'm very open. I run, I would argue, probably one of the best accelerator programs. When I will share everything with anybody, if you want to start an accelerator, I will share everything. Because you know what? I'm not worried about you stealing this. I'm like, good luck executing this. We've built this over the last like six and a half years. We have different resources and knowledge that outsiders don't have. So good luck trying to rebuild it. It's the same thing with startups. I don't care, right? Like if you want to copy my idea or copy this, good luck. I'm trying to execute as well as we do. If you execute it better than me, then we deserve to lose. <laughs> Здравствуйте. Меня зовут Жена. Я возвращаюсь к вопросу образов... Я возвращаюсь к вопросу образовательных курсов. Буквально через месяц у нас открывается французская школа сервиса, и мы столкнулись с такой проблемой. Я как раз из тех, кто вкладывает меньше денег, практически из ничего делаю этот проект. Вот. И ну, я потратила, конечно, время, четыре месяца уже на этот проект. Вот, и я хотела бы, я столкнулась с такой проблемой. Вообще, что касается сервиса в области гостеприимства и общественного питания, ну это полный швах у нас в Казахстане. Очень много проблем, именно владельцы ресторанов и отелей имеют массу проблем и с сервисом, и с организацией питания, и с прочими другими моментами этого бизнеса. Я хотела бы у вас спросить, как все хотят это делать правильно, но не всякий хочет обучать своего сотрудника. И как убедить владельцев ресторанов и отелей, чтобы они все-таки поступательно и постепенно занялись тем, чтобы обучать своих сотрудников? So, so the question about training and how you get sort of, you know, how you build the market, right, and get people, you said, so, so this is how I think about it, right? Number one, I think you have to build a case study, right? And so a lot of times it's about going and finding, maybe it's a friendly restaurant or hotel, something, some, somebody that, or maybe it's a very well-known hotel or well-known restaurant, and actually spending time working with them, right? Like using your service or product and actually helping them build a case study and show results. And then once you have results, hopefully it works, right? Whatever you're building or making actually works. And going and using that as a case study to go and say, hey, we help train this hotel staff. And by doing this, they're able to increase their customer satisfaction by 50% and actually make an extra whatever million dollars, whatever the, the number is, and build one or two or three of these case studies by working very closely with them in the beginning. And then once you have these case studies, actually going and sharing this with other people, and once you actually have like a proven case study and you share this with other people, it's, that's how you actually start to change people's mentality and get sales. Does that answer the question? Здравствуйте, меня зовут Айнура. Hi. Hi. Uh, мы основатели компании Tour Center, это система онлайн бронирования туров и экскурсий. Когда мы стартовали наш проект, мы вообще изначально у нас было видение, что мы масштабируемся на весь мир и по всему миру можно будет покупать онлайн туры, экскурсии. Но в дальнейшем, когда мы стали изучать рынок, увидели, что есть TripAdvisor, есть Get Your Guide, которые уже делают подобные сервисы, мы решили выбрать нишу, то есть освоить страны Казахстана и шелкового пути. 
и с таким образом ну, сузить, скажем, да, на, нашу нишу. И вот вопрос, насколько реально, если мы освоим эти рынки, продаться таким крупным компаниям, да, как TripAdvisor, насколько им это интересно и как это делается? Um, so I actually think you're doing the right thing in general, and I, I think a lot of times it's about being systematic about what you're doing. So number one, you understand this region and market very well, and it's easier to get access to customers. So it's actually very logical. Um, I actually think like, you know, is, could this become a huge global business? It's hard to say, but what I would say is that at least you want it being super focused on the region that you know very, very well. It's about a foundation, right? So it's almost like, it's almost like taking sort of like a, going up the stairs, right? Like it's very, very hard from going from step one, like staircase number one to, you know, the hundredth step. You want to be very systematic in step one, step two, you know, the staircase one, two, three, four. You want to be very systematic. And who knows, right? Like maybe it'll evolve into something global. But I actually think by focusing on a niche, you actually get by locking in the customers in, you never know what will turn up from a global perspective. But I've never seen a company start from like step one to go to a hundred. It just doesn't work. And so your systematic approach probably makes the most sense. Um, I don't know if it'd be global, but also bear in mind, right? Like for you to go global, most companies probably take five to 10 years before that happens. So you're still very, very early. So stay focused on this customer. You can still build a great business just re in the region. Good luck. <laughs>